He's getting older. Champagne room. Oh, hit the full button. But not wiser. Everybody has affinity for cop. This is the Lefty Show. Welcome, everybody, to the Lefty Show. I am your host, Lefty. Glad to be here with all of you today. Wednesday. It's Wednesday, right? Right? I'm losing count of my days. Wednesday, the 5th of November in the year of our Spaghetti Monster 2014. Welcome one, welcome all to the Lefty Show. Hope to put on a great show for you today. Episode number 110. Thank you to everybody for watching, liking, favoriting, subscribing on YouTube. YouTube.com slash LeftyOX is where you can go to find the show in its YouTube formation. You can also follow me on Twitter at Lefty643. Thank you to everybody that's been donating. I'm raising.com forward slash 643 productions. That's I'm raising.com forward slash 643 productions. And thank you to everybody that has been sharing the show. Helping the show grow by sharing it with friends, family, and coworkers. You can find the show wherever you get your podcasts for your PC, tablet, or mobile device. Search The Lefty Show. Be sure to subscribe and download all the episodes at your leisure, and you can take the show with you and share it with friends and family and say, look at this awesome show. It's amazing. You should listen to it. You should also subscribe. You should also search The Lefty Show wherever you get your podcasts. Uh, have an update on, uh, on a story I talked about in the last, last episode of the show. And it concerns Lena Dunham of HBO series fame. And when I originally talked about what was going, going on with Lena Dunham and the outrage surrounding a book that she published in September and only now is it making waves At least these kinds of waves. I don't know how the original sales did. I don't know. But uh, when I originally covered it, I hadn't read everything there is or was or is. I hadn't read the, uh, the specific excerpt having to do with Lena Dunham at seven years old opting to just one day inspect her one-year-old, her infant sister's vagina. Now, I don't want... Red, I don't, I'm not here to say that Lena Dunham is a criminal. I'm not here to say that Lena Dunham is a rapist or committed a, a sexual crime. I'm not even here to say necessarily that Lena Dunham... Is, committed sexual abuse I will say that it was at best at best very very questionable not weird she plays it off as oh I was a weird kid no 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 no. you were a questionable kid bordering on you were doing things wrong paying your little sister to sit on your knee or to lay on you while you watch TV Trying to compensate her so that you can kiss her on the mouth for five seconds. Or uh, enticing her to sleep in bed with you or in the bedroom with you. And you'll lay the, you'd lay there masturbating. And then one day just up and inspecting your infant sister's vagina. That's not necessarily a sexual crime because I wasn't there. And you're juvenile. So I, I don't know if that makes you a delinquent. Because you don't have the, you know, it's not a crime necessarily, but it it may, might make you a delinquent. Lena Dunham may be a delinquent or may have been a juvenile delinquent with what she did to her sister. And she put that all in a book. That's not the whole book. It was, a, it's their memoirs. And this was, she talked about her childhood and, and her sexual exploration. Okay, I get it. But it's not just weird. It's bordering on delinquency, what I've read, and what she, what she flouts. Says, look at this. Look. Look at me being a borderline sexual delinquent. Look at this. Oh, my God. And she's profiting from it, being defended by people 
for what she said, these specific things. Oh, she's just being a kid. Dur, 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 dur. And I, <clears throat> again, I don't have, I don't take issue with the defense of Lena Dunham because I think she's a criminal. I think she may have been a delinquent, but that's an irrelevant issue. That's an irrelevant topic. My point is this. Imagine if a guy did it. And I said this when I covered it last time. But imagine specifically if a male said all the things that he said, that Lena Dunham has said, and, and recounted these specific stories bordering on sexual delinquency in a book, published that book, profited from that book, and now is saying, what do you want from me? I'm not a weirdo or blah, 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 anything like that. What would the response be if a male celebrity published in a book their borderline sexual delinquency? What would the response be? Would it take until November of that year for people to comb through the book and finally raise the question like, hey, wait a minute, what's this that you wrote, big stroker? What is all this you talked about? Now, keep in mind... You have to flip the genders for both because it's not fair to say, well, what if a guy did that to his sister? Let's just say, for the sake of argument, that it was a brother doing it to his brother. Not a brother. <laughs> he didn't go out there and hey, hey, buddy, how you doing? Let me... No, no, no. His brother, his younger brother, infant brother, did all the things that Lena Dunham admits to doing. Master... Hey, come in and sleep in the room with me. And then uh, I'm going to, uh, 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 because the thrill of it all. And I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. Imagine a guy did that. What would the response be? Would there be any defense at all? Would the people that are, that are out crying against the profiting from these stories, would they, would they be shouted down as crazies, as right, right wing crazies at all? No. They'd, they would be at the forefront. They'd be on CNN. They'd be the people. Uh, uh, we're, we're, well, you need to, this, this dude, he needs to answer for what he said because it's, this is immoral for, to, to one, do this, and then two, to profit from it, to profit from the possible sexual delinquency concerning your infant, infant brother. Here is the excerpt from Lena Dunham's book. Here it is, because she can claim twisted my words out of context. They're your words. They are from the book. And that's the other thing. Oh, don't twist my words. Don't twist my words. It was taken out of context. It's in your book, you idiot. Anybody can go read it. Here's an excerpt from Lena Dunham's book concerning her interaction with her younger sibling, her infant sibling. She was seven. And her sibling was one year old. Okay. Lena Dunham, seven, and her infant sister. Now, you want to tell me if you want to, if you want to mount the Blagojevich defense that you need to play the whole tapes, you know, you need to read the whole book to get the context. I don't know. I don't know if there's really any context in which what is written in the first person makes this okay. But anyway, here is a page from Lena Dunham's book, Not That Kind of Girl. This is courtesy of The Independent. Do we all have uter uteruses? I asked my mother when I was seven. Yes, she told me. We're born with them and with all our eggs, but they start out very small, and they aren't ready to make babies until we're older. I look at my younger sister, now a slim, tough one-year-old, and at her tiny belly. I imagined her eggs inside of her, like the sack of spider eggs in Charlotte's Web, and her uterus the size of a thimble. Does her vagina look like mine? I guess so, my mother said. Just smaller. Here's the money, here's the money paragraph. One day, as I sat in our driveway in Long Island playing with blocks and buckets, my curiosity got the best of me. Grace, her younger sister, was sitting up babbling and smiling and I leaned down between her legs and carefully spread, her, spread open her vagina. She didn't resist, and when I saw what was inside, I shrieked. My mother came running. Mama, Mama, Grace has something in there. My mother didn't bother asking why I had opened Grace's vagina, 
This was within the spectrum of things I did. She just she just on her knees and looked she just got on her knees and looked for herself. It quickly became apparent that Grace had stuffed six or seven pebbles in there. My mother removed them patiently while Grace cackled, thrilled that her prank had been a success. So you got a whole family of weirdos. Wow. Okay. Hey, I'm going to prank thing, prank my family by sticking things up there. Yeah. Oh, wow. But imagine, I want to take you back to that one paragraph. One day, as I sat in our driveway in Long Island playing with blocks and buckets, my curiosity got the best of me. Grace was sitting up, babbling and smiling, and I leaned down between her legs and carefully spread open her vagina. She didn't resist, and when I saw what was inside, I shrieked. Imagine a guy said that about his brother. Again, not a brother, his brother, his younger brother. A now 20-something-year-old burgeoning celebrity writes memoirs and is talking about an interaction when he was seven between himself and his infant brother. One day as I sat in our driveway in Long Island playing with blocks and buckets, my curiosity got the best of me. Steve was sitting up, babbling and smiling, and I leaned down between his legs and carefully th fingered his penis. He didn't resist, and when I saw what was inside, I shrieked. That, on top of, I also paid my brother to let me kiss him on the lips. I also coerced my brother to sleep in the same room with me while I masturbated. I also comp coerced my brother into laying on me so that I could receive some kind of sexual thrill while he did so while we watched television. Imagine a guy said that about his brother. Again, it's not fair. You have to fill, flip both genders. I mean, if you want to go male-female, that's easy. That's easy. But just flip both. Make it a guy-on-guy guy guy crime. Guy-on-guy guy crime. Isn't the, guy, isn't the guy who says, yeah, when I was seven, I, without prompting, without provocation, I just started messing with my infant brother's genitals. I just went, oh, yeah, I'm starting to touch my infant brother's genitals. And I had all, already done all these sexual things. And I would continue this quasi-sexual relationship with him for years after. But this one time when I was seven and he was an infant, I leaned down and started playing with his penis. It was, uh, uh. That guy's labeled a sexual deviant. Investigation. What's the statute of limitations on something like that? On, on possible sexual crimes? Investigate it. Oh, my God. How can this guy be a celebrity? Why are we giving him money? But Lena Dunham does it. And, oh, well, she's just a special lotus flower. And ISU is just a weird kid. Da, 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 da. It's not that Lena Dunham is a bad person. Lena Dunham probably isn't a bad person. She's certainly uh, weird and not in the good kind of way, bordering on sexual delinquent. Because we all have weird sexual things when we were growing up. We all do. We don't like to talk about it. We don't because it's, I, it's weird. It's something that we all do that we don't like to talk about. It's one of those things. We all, we all poop, but we don't like to talk about how we poop, even though maybe it's a good idea because you can identify a lot about yourself, about your health by your poop. Size, color, frequency, consistency, all these things. And if you could be open about it with somebody, not even a healthcare professional, but if we were all, you know, we all know a chronic cough is bad. Like, oh, you better get that checked out. But if we were all open about pooping as much as we were about coughing, like, oh, man, I, you know, I had the runs for the last week and a half, man. They're just, they're like, it's like a weird kind of dark, dark brown. Like, are you drinking a lot? Like, you might want to get that checked out by a doctor. There are probably a lot of people that have diseases or some kind of, issue identified way earlier on if we were open and honest about pooping but we do it we don't like to talk about it similarly sex is something that we all do and we don't like to talk about it publicly in fact in fact if you do it in the wrong setting it could be criminal or you could be held liable it's tortious if you in a work setting talk about how you're railing your wife at home and a female uppity biatch hears it on the other side of the room, oh my God, sexual harassment. 
Or the other way, if you're talking about how, oh my God, I found this, uh, my husband or my boyfriend or my girlfriend or whatever, and your girl's like, oh yeah, he's giving it to me. And, <laughs> and then there's that guy who's like, oh, equality, equality. Well, now I'm going to claim sexual harassment, even though he was sitting there listening. Oh, yeah, I like it. But oh my God, in the interest of equality, I'm going to report you because, oh my God, oh, I'm so upset by all this. You're in trouble now. If we could all be open about sex, just as we are coughing, we would probably be a lot better off. We'd identify a lot of things like, oh man, I really like to, you know, rub one out, work it out to, to drawings of eight year old girls. Like what? What the hell is wrong with you, Frank? What are you, what the hell is your problem, man? You got to get that under control, bro. Because sooner or later that might turn into something else. Now, don't make it a crime, but just let other people kind of help them out. Like, oh, man, I really like to do this. I really like to do that. Or I'm having a lot of sex or I'm having not a lot of sex. Oh, okay, well, that could explain a lot of things. Like, hey, why are you such an asshole? Like, ah, oh, well, I haven't been laid in six months. Like, oh, okay. Well, that's, you know, we all have, we all have cold streaks now and again. Or it's like, why are you so happy? Like, oh, just having great sex. It's amazing. And it would go so far to remove so much stigmas that we have. Because when I was in college, I know I'm going off a bit on a tangent here, but this, I'm on a roll, trust me. When I was in college, the guys that I hung out with would routinely talk about their sexual conquests. And I played along. I was never really comfortable with it. You know, I, and I know that's kind of like, a, I was there, but I didn't really do anything. So, you know, okay. But they all kind of, they all were open about their sexual conquest. And it was just expected, like, oh, yeah, good job. Woo, bro, high five it. But a girl was viewed as a slut if she did the same thing. If she did nothing else other than what the guys were being praised for she was a slut or a whore or a uh, you don't want any of that and i think i think at least a little bit now there's the whole gender issue thing that they're blah 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 but i think i think that if we were just op as open about sex as we were about other things in our daily lives because we all have sex we all want to have sex or we have all wanted to have sex, or we all will want to have sex at some point in our lives. It's just something we do. Heterosexual, homosexual, transsexual, whatever, doesn't matter. There are We have sexual drives, and if we are open about those, all of us, not just guys, everybody, I think it will, do, it will go a good way in removing some of the stigma about sexuality. Because guys can be promiscuous and it's okay. Girls are promiscuous and they're sluts. Wait, why does that make any? That doesn't make any sense. That makes absolutely no sense. And I think at least part of it derives from we don't like to talk about it. So we just kind of we internalize it and go, okay, well, me having sex, that's good. This other person having sex, though, ooh, bad. But if we were all open and we all realized and all had a a general open understanding that we all like to have sex, then there wouldn't be as much of that stupid stigma surrounding sexuality and gender. Men being promiscuous, good. He's good. Women being promiscuous for some stupid reason, bad. That's dumb. It's one of the stupid things about society. But we need to be open about our sexuality. Now, circling back to Lena Dunham, we all have weird sex when we were growing up and we hit puberty or were just kind of figuring out that there was something down there, whatever it was, hanging her inside. We, we've, what is this? What is this? <laughs> Imagine, like, what, huh? What are you doing? What is that? We, it, it, it's not malicious. It's just, what, what is this? Oh, this, this kind of feels good. Okay. You hit puberty. Oh my God, you're walking around with a, if you're a guy, you're walking around with a tent in your pants 24 7. It's incredible. Like you do, it, you did not know that there was that much blood in your body. Your heart works overtime keeping that tent in your pants. 
What are you excited about? Nothing. You're walking around. You see a locker that looks vaguely. You see a you see a box that looks vaguely feminine. You go, oh, oh yeah, oh, ah, yeah. We all have that. Okay. But you know what? I think I I start to draw the line at seven year old playing with the genitals of an infant. Okay? Because that's what happened. Not just like, oh, I was seven, she was six, and da 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 da. No, you were seven and she was an infant. An infant. And you go, <laughs> And I'm, again, I'm not mad at Lena Dunham, and I don't think Lena Dunham's a bad person for having a sexual experience and learning and exploring sexuality, even with an infant. I start to draw the line there. That doesn't mean it's like, oh my God, you're a deviant and a problem, and a da, 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 we have to get rid of you. She's certainly weird, and pro- somebody probably that was just probably a very interesting person to talk to, but not to, I don't know do things with. But what I'm more angered at is that I see a whole lot of defense for what Lena Dunham wrote and profited from. Profiting directly from telling a story about playing with the genitals of an infant. She was of some cognizant age. She was old enough to remember, old enough to form a memory of this instance And she's profiting directly from recounting a story in which she, uh, again, at an age where she can form a memory, fondling the genitals of an infant. And I think that if a guy did that in today's society, he'd be universally, the, the, the book would be universally panned. I don't know if anybody would publish it. And if it did get published, lambasted by, by orders of magnitude more than Lena Dunham has. Lena Dunham's criticizers are labeled as right-wing nutjobs. If a guy did it, everybody who criticized him would be a champion of sexual rights of infants. But what changed? What changed in the Lena Dunham real case in which people are going, uh, yeah, it's pretty weird that you wrote a book in which you're profiting directly from and telling a story openly and blithely about how you as a seven-year-old toyed with the genitals unprompted, toyed with the genitals of an of your infant sister. What changed between that and a theoretical dude doing the same thing to his infant brother? Never to go, oh, wow, dude, that's, that's really messed up. The people that said really messed up, then nobody would say boo to them because, oh, yeah, that's, that's pretty messed up. That's really weird. At best, that's really weird. But what changed? Well, Lena Dunham's a hardcore uh, liberal feminist, a female hardcore liberal. Is there any, might, might there be something? Might there be something to that? And never mind the fact that she made at the end. One day as I sat in our driveway in Long Island playing with blocks and buckets, my curiosity got the best of me. Grace was sitting up, babbling and smiling, and I leaned down between her legs and carefully spread open her vagina. Next sentence. She didn't resist, and when I saw what was inside, I shrieked. If a guy had taken the time to make specific reference of the fact that his victim, victim, did not resist, If the guy had said, well, she didn't resist or he didn't resist, what would that be labeled as? You know, you know, come on. Even if you disagree, your mind flashed to what it would be painted as. If a guy said, well, if a guy made specific reference of the fact that the victim did not resist, what would that be labeled as? Would that be, would people go, oh, well, you know, they didn't resist. So it's not really that big of a deal. No, people go, oh, my God, you're talking, you're victim blaming now. Oh, my God, you're saying that it's okay. You're basically saying he was asking for it. But Lena Dunham, special lotus flower that she is, oh, yeah, she didn't resist when I was a seven-year-old and she was an infant and I was toying with her genitals. In other news, uh, well, close it out by saying our society is incredibly hypocritical. Incredibly hypocritical. And... The answer to perceived prejudice is not hypocrisy. 
It's not. Just like I say, the answer to prejudice is not prejudice. It can't be. The answer, similarly, the answer to perceived hypocrisy of society, the, the answer to perceived gender bias in society is not gender bias in the other direction. It's not. It can't be. But, oh, well, Lena Dunham, special Lotus Flower. Okay. All right. In other news, voting gubernatorial elections across these vast United States are finally over. And I just want to say thank you to everybody. We, we lasted another year. We dealt with the awful, oh, no more political ads for at least a little bit. Oh, my God. I hate, I hate political advertisements. I just... Oh, they're so bad. They are so bad. How? I don't know how they're not slanderous or libelous. Is, is it print technically? I don't know. I don't know how they're not slander slash libel. I, I, I don't know. I and they just get away with it, and then the super PAC thing, and the the near infinite money for some of these gubernatorial races, and then the presidential races. It's just oh sweet Jesus! It's all bullcrap. It's all bullcrap. In in the state of Illinois, in the state of Illinois, it was between Bruce Rauner. Let's see who who did. Uh, who did he win? Bruce Rauner and Pat Quinn. That's what. That's who it was. I even forgot because I just. I'm. I'm just this. I'm nonplussed by the electoral process in the state of Illinois. Running for governor, Pat Quinn running for re-election, and Bruce Rauner. Pat Quinn a Democrat, Rauner a Republican, and there. It's been every single show you watch on television in Illinois. You are going to see at least three or four political advertisements, sometimes back to back, and it's all crap. It's all mudslinging or polishing turds, turds throwing mud at other turds, or turds trying to polish polish themselves. Or excuse me, uh, committees paid for by the committees for people that are completely independent from this turd, but just so happen to really, really, really want to polish this turd and throw mud at this other turd. They're all turds. They are all turds. That's it's it. It's I and I say it because I I don't vote and I'm proud of that. You know, you'll see people. Well, I voted today and I do, 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 do. and I say you're an idiot. If you vote, you're an idiot. If you vote, I will I will say this. I will proclamate this thusly. If you vote in the current political cr- climate in the United States of America. You are an idiot. You are just an idiot. You're a fool. And and it is you, voters, it is you who are to blame for our current climate. The police state, the distrust of politicians, the career politicians, the uh, business cronyism, and all those things, the FCC, which we're going to talk about later in the show, perhaps in another episode, the FCC and getting in bed with, uh, with, with, with internet providers, with ISPs, all of that, all of that is on you, not on me. It's not on me because I don't participate. I am an active dissenter. I dissent all the time. I say, I will not, I will not further any of this. I don't want to, I want it, I want it all blown up. From the bullcrap super PACs, the endless money, the campaign ads, which should be libel, and the picking between two crooks in a in a in just a broken first past the post system, I don't stand for any of it, and I'm not going to further any of it by voting. That's what you do when you go vote, because you think you're trying to make a choice. You think, oh well, I'm I'm helping, I'm helping decide, right? You're helping decide between two crooks. This is my favorite thing because people say, well, if you don't vote, you you have no right to complain. And that's crap. It's crap. That's bull. It's just it's just people that had nothing to do this day thinking that they 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 have some influence on a system that forgot about them a long time ago. A long time ago. Let me ask you this. Do you think anything would change? 
Think of the last, I don't know, let's see, four presidential elections, okay? No, 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 think of the last eight. Clinton, Clinton, Bush, Bush, Obama, Obama. That's six. Damn it. Counting, counting things. Think of the last six presidential elections, okay? Clinton, Clinton, Bush, Bush, Obama, Obama. Well, it was Gore there in the first one for a bit, but then, but then, no, 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 Obama. There's the second one, it was Gore. No, it was the first one, it was Gore. That's right. Ah, yes, Indecision 2000. That's what it was. And then September 11th happened and solidified Bush as a president. I got it. Think of the last six presidential elections, okay? And think of who lost those elections. Whoever it was. Oh, <laughs> Let's assume that instead of whomever had won those elections, those six elections, the loser had won. What would change? How would society be markedly any different? Would September 11th have still happened? Now, assuming, you know, the butterfly effect, not getting into anything like that. But the only thing that changed is the man who's sitting at the helm. The last, what would that be? 24 years. The only thing that has changed is the man who's sitting at the helm. Would September 11th or something like that still happen? Would Al Qaeda still be pissed at us? Yes. Would the housing bubble still have happened? Yes. Would the economy still have collapsed because of crony capitalism and all the things that wall street was allowed to do and the greed of consumers and, and, uh, lenders, would that have all happened still? Yeah, probably. Would the minimum wage still, we would be fight. we're fighting for it now. It, no, it still hasn't changed. We've been fighting for decades to raise the minimum wage to a livable level. Still hasn't happened. Nothing would be markedly different. Nothing would change. And as a result of September 11th, assuming that still happened in the alternate other guy wins universe, would the Patriot Act still pass? Yeah, it would. Because that got bipartisan support. So you can't say, oh, well, it was the evil Republicans that came in and swooped in and took our rights. Oh, that bipartisan support. It would have passed as an amendment to the Constitution if that's what they wanted. It all would, nothing would have changed. If you vote, you're an idiot. If you vote and think, yes, this is going to change things. Other than on a microscopic, on, a, on, a, on the micro level, you know, specific narrow referendums that's all you got all you have are specific narrow referendums and i refuse to act in furtherance of those because that justifies the whole process yeah it's great it's great that oregon and and washington dc have now legalized recreational marijuana not decriminalized legalized recreational amounts of marijuana that's great and that's a result of referenda passed at the voting booth. Specific, not not like vote for this guy and this guy passes this for you. This is specific to the people, okay. But the very fact that people showed up to pass those referendums furthers the the other bullcrap at the top of the ballot. And I ask this to everybody that says, oh, well, if you don't vote, you can't complain. Bull, of course I can complain. Of course I can because you voted for a crook. I didn't vote for a crook. I voted for no crooks. And if we assume, if we operate under the assumption that there truly are no non-crooks in the world of professional politicking, if we agree that when you go into a voting booth, presidential, gubernatorial, doesn't matter, whatever, when you go into a voting booth, you are voting for two crooks. You are choosing one crook over the other crook. That's it. One turd over the other turd. You're you're voting for one of two turds. Because the, oh, the, the... Green Party, independents, kiss my ass. Get out of here. First past the post system, two party all the way. No chance for a third party. None. Zero. Mathematically impossible. So you're voting for two turds. You are saying, when you if we agree on that assumption, if we agree that basically people, if you percolate to the top and you're talking about governor, senator, representative, or president. If you get to that, you're probably a lifetime politic crook. If you if we agree to that, that you get once you get to that level, you're for all intents and purposes a crook and a turd, then you are saying, when you say, well, if you don't vote, you have to you have no right to complain, you are saying 
that in order to complain about a crook or a turd, I have to vote for a crook or a turd. That's your argument. And that makes no sense. It makes absolutely no sense when you break it down to that level. Well, if you don't vote, you have no right to complain. Well, why not? Because you didn't vote for a turd or a crook. Okay, so I can't complain about a crook unless I voted for another crook. Unless I vote, unless I did something that would it be just as bad as what we have now. Unless I did that, I cannot complain about things being bad now. Kiss my ass. Get out of here. I don't vote. You shouldn't either. Till we blow up this whole system. Blow it all up like a bad sports team. Just blow it up, trying it all over again. They're all crooks, and it's bullcrap to say, oh, well, you have to vote for a crook to complain about a crook. Kiss my ass. Let's do some news. All right, we got some great news to talk about today. This is from uh, time.com. Two dozen retailers won't open on Thanksgiving, and they're shaming ones that will. In one of the most notable trends thus far in the holiday shopping season, several mall mainstays are engaged in an aggressive game of Thanksgiving store hour one-upsmanship. The skirmishes began with Macy's announcement it would open for Black Friday sales starting at 6 p.m. on Thanksgiving night, two hours earlier than last year's 8 p.m. opening time. Coles and Sears, among others, are matching Macy's opening, uh, ma- matching Macy's by opening the doors to shoppers at 6 p.m. on Thanksgiving. While J.C. Penney is trying to trump the competition with a 5 p.m. opening, 5 p.m. opening, Best Buy, Walmart, and Toys R Us have a history of opening earlier and earlier each year for Thanksgiving slash Black Friday. And by the time they announce sale launch times for this year, it's likely they'll be welcoming deal-seeking shoppers sometime in the early afternoon of Thanksgiving before the day's first NFL game has even ended, and before the turkey is on the table in many American households. For that matter, many WalMarts are open 24/7 every day of the year, including Thanksgiving. Another contender for the title of Biggest Thanksgiving Grinch is Kmart, which is opening at the depressingly early hour of 6 a.m. on Thanksgiving Day and will stay open for 42 hours in a row. At the same time, however, there are some notable national retailers that are refusing to open on Thanksgiving. Forbes, Think Progress, and Mental Floss are among the resources that have rounded up two dozen or so stores that have confirmed they will remain closed on Thanksgiving. The list includes warehouse membership stores Costco, BJ's, and Sam's Club, home improvement giants Home Depot and Lowe's, department stores Dillard's and Nordstrom, specialty retailers like GameStop, DSW, and Petco, and discount chains such as Burlington Coat Factory, Marshalls, and TJ Maxx. There are a few others not cited in these lists, including uh, Cabela's, which is expected to be closed on Thanksgiving but is hosting special shopper events outside stores uh, as early as 9 p.m. on Thanksgiving night, Menards, uh, and Von Mar, an Iowa-based department store chain with 29 locations in 13 states. Now, this is being heralded as great. You know, these companies, oh, look at these great things for the people. Look at all the, for the workers so that people don't have to come in. They stay close so workers don't have to come in and, and spend Thanksgiving working and they can spend it with their families. And and look at how great we are. And, da, 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 da. and it is, it would be nice if it was genuine. Now, I'm not here to say that I know to take it to the bank that this is disingenuous crap, but I say that I have an inkling that this is just, well, we can't really compete with Macy's, Best Buy's, Walmart, or Toys R Us, right? GameStop isn't going to compete with Best Buy. What is GameStop going to offer at a midnight sale or opening on Thanksgiving? What are they going to, what are they going to offer? What is Costco going to offer? Sam's Club, food? I mean, yeah, they have some electronics and, and uh, other merchandise, but it's not to the level of the Best Buys, Walmarts, Toys R Us, Macy's, J.C. Penney. What, what are you going to go to? What are you going to go to Sam's Club at six in the six in the afternoon on Thanksgiving? Like, oh, I got to get me one of these. I got to get me a big ass TV. Go to Best Buy. You got to. You go to you go to Sam's Club to buy food, and you buy other things along the way. Oh, they've got shirts. Oh, they've got an inflatable funhouse thing. Oh, sweet! Good to believe it. But you go to Best Buy, J.C. Penney's, and other things for for those things for the things they sell there. 
Sam's Club just kind of has TVs. They go, hey, oh, you're here for food and all the food that we've got. Yeah, 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 yeah. Hey, by the way, we got TVs for you over here. Not having big, gigantic sales. And I think this is a bunch of retailers trying to generate some good PR and saying, hey, you know, well, we, we weren't going to compete with them on Thanksgiving anyway with the big, uh, big brick and mortar stores. We weren't going to compete with them anyway, so look at us being nice to our employees. And it's just, it's sad, really. It's sad that this is the bone that gets thrown to menial, menial employees. It's sad that this is the bone. Because it should be nobody's open on Thanksgiving. You know, you want to go Black Friday, we open at midnight. Okay, all right. And then you get paid double time, and you get paid double time of your actual living wage. Because think about this. You know, the aside from, aside from Costco, because as I understand it, Costco is the closest to we will take less and pay our employees more so and give them benefits so that they are happy, productive people and our, our things will cost a little bit more and people will just have to deal with that. Costco is one of the closest corporations that I've seen to that model. And this may be this may be a legitimate thing to Costco. Best Buy the or Sam's Club, that's Walmart. That's Walmart part D. That's just Walmart. So whatever you're making at Walmart, you're making at Sam's Club. Don't be thinking that the people that work at Sam's Club are making what Costco makes. Those Costco guys, as I understand it, are taken care of. And props to Costco. But everybody else, call me when you're paying a living wage. Call me when you're paying a living wage. This is, this is like the voting argument. It's meaningless. This thing, this, oh, well, we'll give you Thanksgiving office. It's meaningless. It's just a... Pfft. We're screwing you every other day of the year, employees, because we're not paying you a living wage, or you have to be a man at a managerial or supervisory position in order to learn earn a living wage or a livable wage. That's where you have to you have to be up there. But every other everybody else, all the other grunts, yeah, you're making eight fifty an hour, nine bucks an hour. And when you work, when you get overtime, all right, you get time and a half. What's time and a half of nine bucks an hour? You have to be earning $10 an hour to earn time and a half to make your time and a half a livable wage. $15 is, is a bare livable wage. $10 an hour is not a livable wage. Then this is the bone that gets thrown their way. Call me when you're paying them a, liv a livable wage. Call me then. Then I, then I will take my hat off to you. But you're going to work them to the bone on Black Friday. Oh, we're giving them Thanksgiving off, but you got to be at work at 1130 on Thanksgiving night because we're opening it at midnight for Black Friday anyway. And you're only making 850 an hour. And what do you make on a holiday? Oh, well, we're open. You know, we're going to work you to the bone on holiday and, and you'll on the holiday season. And, and if you work holidays, you get double time. What do you get double time? What's double time? 850? Eight bucks? A living wage. You have to earn double time for many of these companies, many of these starting wages. You have to be in double time territory in order to make a living, a livable wage. The bare minimum livable wage. Oh, 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 yeah, but we, but you get Thanksgiving off. Ha <laughs> ha! This is, it's... You, you pound and you pound and you pound, and then finally there's a breaking point. Finally, there's a squeal point. And then you just roll it back just a little bit. You pound them and you pound them and you pound them. More hours, more hours, more hours, fewer benefits, fewer benefits, fewer benefits. Barely making full time, barely making full time, barely making full time. No increase in pay, no increase in pay, no increase in pay. More hours, more hours, holiday time, holiday time. Hey, wait a minute. Okay, you get Thanksgiving off. It, do, it does nothing. This Thanksgiving off does nothing to undo the fact that, again, Costco, BJ's, aside from Costco, BJ's, Sam's Club, Home Depot, Lowe's, Dillard's, Nordstrom, GameStop, DSW, Petco, Burlington Coat Factory, Marshalls, and TJ Maxx. This giving your grunt employees the day off on Thanksgiving, what about Christmas Eve? What about that? 
Hmm? What if they're or what if they're Kwanzaa people? You don't know. What if they're Kwanzaa? What if they like to throw down on some Kwanzaa like me? I'm a Kwanzaa guy myself, personally. What are you going to do? This does nothing. Giving them Thanksgiving Day off, despite the fact that those many of those people, especially uh, probably DSW, Burlington Coat Factory Marshals, and TJ Maxx, they have to be there early, 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 early Black Friday morning. Giving them the day off does nothing to undo the complete absence of a livable wage for anybody under a supervisory position. And call me when you do it. Call me when call me when that's what you have. Because otherwise this is just this is just PR nonsense. In other news, as we wrap up the lefty show in the home stretch stretch stretch, we've got an update. An update to the FCC net neutrality fight. This is from the Wall Street Journal. The head, of, the head of the Federal Communications Commission is laying the groundwork for expanding the agency's authority over broadband service. People familiar with, the, uh, with his thinking say, a move long sought by advocates of stricter regulation for inter- of Internet service providers. But the plan by FCC Chairman Tom Wheeler isn't expected to satisfy all proponents of net neutrality, the principle that all Internet traffic should be treated equally, because it would still allow broadband providers to cut deals with content companies for special access to customers. The people familiar with the plan emphasize that nothing is final, nothing that any proposal would require a vote of the full five full five-member commission, which is made up of three Democrats and two Republicans. And whatever approach the FCC tries almost certainly will be met with a legal challenge from broadband providers who would resist giving the agency a heavier hand. Mr. Wheeler has said an open internet is a goal in developing the rules, along with barring providers from slowing down or blocking content to consumers. Reclassifying broadband to expand the FCC's authority would explicitly, without explicitly banning broadband providers' deals, would allow the agency to keep such authority in its back pocket to block any arrangements that it views as anti-competitive. He also wants to ensure that the FCC's final rules, which are expected by year end, can hold up in court. Advocates of net neutrality say the only way to achieve it is to classify the internet as common carrier or a public utility. The, broad, the broadband providers would like the FCC to keep them classified as information services, which makes the industry subject to far less regulation. Caught in the middle, Mr. Wheeler is close to settling on a hybrid approach. People close to the chairman say the emerging proposal is a departure from an FCC plan put forth last spring, which kept broadband classified as an information service, though Mr. Wheeler at the time made clear that he welcomed input on whether to go the common carrier route. The plan now under consideration would separate broadband into two distinct services, a retail one in which consumers would pay broadband providers for internet access and a back-end one in which broadband providers serve as the conduit for websites to dis- distribute content. The FCC would then classify the back-end service as a common carrier, giving the agency the ability to police any deals between content companies and broadband prov- providers. The emerging plan reflects proposals submitted by Mozilla Foundation and the Center for Democracy and Technology, though it departs from both in parts. The main advantage of the hybrid proposal, as opposed to full reclassification, is that it wouldn't require the FCC to reverse earlier decisions to deregulate broadband providers, which were made in the hopes of encouraging the adoption and deployment of high-speed broadband. The authors of the new proposal believe that not having to justify reversing itself would put the FCC on firmer legal ground. Hold on, and here's the thing. They say FC Tom Wheeler's caught in the middle between the people, okay? You represent the interests of the Federal Communications Commission, the federal government, the people, okay? There's no middle. You are a proxy for the thing that represents the people. You are an arm, an administrative arm with some legal authority legal authority, oddly enough, granted to you by the people. Tom Wheeler's job is to look out for the people. There's no middle. No middle. Not to represent the interests of... He's not, that's, not, that's a lobbyist position. What you are saying is Tom Wheeler is caught in the middle between representing the interests of the people and the interests of broadband providers. So you're saying Tom Wheeler is neither a, a representative of the people and he's caught in the middle between being a rep of the people and a, bro, a, a, a cable lobbyist. Which he was. No, he's a representative of the people now. 
He's not a lobbyist. He doesn't have to represent their interests. He should not care about their interests. He should care about the interests of the people his commission represents. But oh, but you just say, oh, well, Tom Wheeler's caught in the middle. He's not. There's no middle. There shouldn't be a middle. And what's more, here's the thing. Here's the thing that you all need to know. Any hybrid approach will lose. Anything short of reclassifying broadband carriers under Title II of the Communications Act, anything short of that will lose in court. Because this is later in the article from from the Wall Street Journal. Previous FCC rules have been overturned by federal courts. In January, an appeals court said the commission was trying to regulate the broadband providers as common carriers, but hadn't designated them as such. Anything short of classifying broadband providers as common carriers will fail in court. That it's just, it will fail. It will fail. And here's a feather in your cap. Here's something to think about. Tom Wheeler knows that. Tom Wheeler was head of the FCC when they lost in January. When, a, when an appeals court, when an appellate court said, well, these regulations, as you have these cable companies, these internet providers classified, these regulations are not within your jurisdiction. You can't do this to them. Come back, they would be legal were they classified as Title II common carriers, but they're not, and you're regulating them as such. Fail. Done. Bam. Get them out of here. Tom Wheeler knows that. And here he is again trying to not classify them completely as common carriers. He knows that will fail. Tom Wheeler was once a part of the biggest lobbying group for internet cable providers. Tom Wheeler knows this will fail. Might Tom Wheeler want this to fail? Let's bring it home. Woo! Another great episode of The Lefty Show. I thank you all for joining me. I had a great time putting on the show for you. I had a great... Uh, I, I hope you had a great time listening. There we go. Thank you to everybody for watching, liking, favoriting, subscribing on YouTube. YouTube.com slash LeftyOX is where you can go to find the show in its YouTube formation. You can also find some great gaming content and vlogs there. 1080p, 60 frames per second. Keep it locked in. YouTube.com slash LeftyOX. Thank you to everybody that's been following me on Twitter at Lefty643. Stay up to date on all the latest and greatest Lefty Show news there. Thank you to everybody that has been donating to the show. I'm Raising.com forward slash 643 Productions is where you can go if you want to help out the show monetarily. That's I'm Raising.com forward slash 643 Productions. And thank you to everybody who's been sharing the show, helping the show grow by sharing it with friends, family, and coworkers. You can find the show wherever you get your podcasts. Just search The Lefty Show for your PC, tablet, or mobile device, uh, Android, iOS. It doesn't matter. Anyway, guys, it's my time. I got to get out of here. Thank you for joining. I hope you enjoyed. I'll catch you next time. I'm out. Bye. Hello there.